Right, let's go to John Littleson. John. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. While the UK government is extending rates relief for only three months in England, the Scottish government is doing so for the whole year, helping the retail, hospitality, leisure and aviation sectors. But the Scottish government wants to go further. So will the minister support Scottish businesses by calling for the full devolution of financial powers to Scotland? Minister. Uh, well, I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman uh, for his question. Uh, it's not correct to say that business rates are only uh, holidays only being extended for three months. There is a period beyond that which is specifically targeted uh, for uh, businesses in the tourism, hospitality and entertainment sector beyond that. Uh, in addition for England, there are substantial uh, restart grants available, money for which is uh, barnetised to the Scottish Government, uh, and they are able to spend that as they see fit. Right. We are now coming to questions to the Prime Minister. I will first call the Prime Minister to answer the engagements question. I will then call Daisy Cooper to ask her supplementary. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The whole House can be proud of the UK's vaccination programme, with over 22.5 million people now having received their first dose across the UK. We can also be proud of the support the UK has given to the international Covid response, including the £548 million we have donated to, to COVAX. I therefore wish to correct the suggestion from the European Council President that the UK has blocked vaccine exports. Uh, let me be clear, we have not blocked the export of a single COVID-19 vaccine or vaccine components. This pandemic has put us all on the same side in the battle for global health. We oppose vaccine nationalism in all its forms. I trust that all sides of the House will join me in rejecting this suggestion and calling on all our partners to work together to tackle this pandemic. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. Uh, in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Let's go to Daisy Cooper. Daisy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The government is throwing a staggering £37 billion at a test and trace system that we know has made barely any difference, but yet it says that it cannot afford to give more than a pitiful 1% pay rise to NHS workers. The Prime Minister has said that he owes his life to them. He stood on the steps of Number 10 and applauded them. So will the Prime Minister do more than pay lip service and pay them the wage that they deserve? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, she is indeed right that we owe a huge amount to our nurses an incalculable debt and that's why I'm proud that we have delivered a 12.8% increase in the starting salary of nurses and are asking the Public Pay Review Body uh, to look at uh, increasing uh, their pay, exceptionally of all uh, the professions in the public sector. And as for test and trace, uh, Mr Speaker, it is thanks to NHS test and trace that we are able to send kids back to school and begin cautiously and irreversibly to reopen our economy and restart our lives. Let's go to Gagam Mahindra. Gagam. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I recently visited Long Marston, Bovingdon, Rickmansworth and Berkhamstead to see the damage the flooding caused to our communities firsthand. Can the Prime Minister assure this House that as the weather gets better, we do not lose the momentum of finding long-term sustainable solutions to prevent flooding in the future and to give residents the security they deserve all year round, irrespective of the weather outside? Prime Minister. I thank my honourable friend for what he's doing to campaign for his uh, local area for flood defences. I want to thank the Environment Agency for their tireless and imaginative and creative work uh, that they do to find solutions. And uh, we're investing £5.2 uh, billion pounds to build 2,000 new flood defences over the next six years. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Who does the Prime Minister think deserves a pay rise more, an NHS nurse or Dominic Cummings? Mr Speaker, uh, as, I, as I told the Honourable Lady for the Liberal Democrats uh, earlier on, uh, we owe a massive debt as a society, and uh, I personally 
uh, to the nurses of our NHS. And that's why we've asked the public sector pay review body exceptionally to look at uh, their pay. I want to stress, however, as the House knows, that uh, starting salaries for nurses have gone up uh, by 12.8% over the last three years. And it is thanks to the package uh, that this government has put in place uh, that we now have 10,600 more nurses in our NHS, Mr Speaker, than there were one year ago, and 60,000 more in training. Starbuck. Mr Speaker, he says nurses' pay has gone up. I know he's desperate to distance himself from the Conservatives' record over the last decade. As he well knows, since 2010, nurses' pay has fallen in real terms by more than £800. And he didn't answer my question. It was a very simple question. He's been talking about affordability. He could could afford to give Dominic Cummings a 40% pay rise. He could afford that. Now he's asking NHS nurses to take a real-term pay cut. How on earth does he justify that? Mr Speaker, as I, re- I repeat the point that I uh, have made, I-, I believe that we all owe a massive uh, debt to our nurses, indeed all our uh, health care workers and our social care workers. And uh, one of the things that uh, they tell me when I go uh, to hospitals, Mr Speaker, as I know the right honourable gentleman does, is that in addition to, to pay, one of their, cho- their top concerns is to have more colleagues on the wards to help them with the undoubted stress and strains of the pandemic, and that's why we provided another £5,000 in bursaries uh, for nurses, another £3,000 to help them with the particular costs uh, of training and with childcare, Mr Speaker. And it's because of that package that this year, I believe, we're seeing another 34% increase in applications uh, for nurses, and we are on target. This government, this government of this party of the NHS, is on target to deliver 50,000 more nurses in our NHS, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, he talks about recruitment. There are currently 40,000 nursing vacancies, 40,000 and 7,000 doctors' vacancies. How on earth does he think a pay cut is going to help solve that? And frankly, I'd take the Prime Minister a bit more seriously if he hadn't spent £2.6 million of taxpayers' money on a Downing Street TV studio or £200,000 on new wallpaper for his flat. Mr Speaker, they say charity starts at home, but I think the Prime Minister is taking a bit too literally. Let me try something very simple. Does the Prime Minister accept accept that NHS staff will be hundreds of pounds worse off a year because of last week's budget? No, I know, Mr Speaker, because, uh, and of course, we will look at what the independent peer review body has to say, uh, exceptionally about the, the nursing profession, whom we particularly, uh, particularly value. But what he should also know, uh, and which he uh, should reflect to the House, is that under this government, uh, we not only began by a record increase uh, in NHS funding over, I think, £33.9 billion, pounds, but because of the pandemic, we put another £63 billion pounds into supporting our NHS, Mr Speaker, on top of the £140 £40 billion pounds of in-year spending, and it's because of this government that in one year alone, Mr Speaker, there are another 49,000 people working in our NHS, and that, I think, is something that is of massive benefit, not just to patients, but to hard-pressed nurses as well. Yeah. Mr Speaker, my mum was a nurse. My sister was a nurse. My wife works in the NHS. I know what it means to work for the NHS. When I clapped for carers, I meant it. He clapped for carers, then he shut the door in their face at the first opportunity. And the more you look at the Prime Minister's decision, the worse it gets. Because it's not just a pay cut, it's a broken promise too. Time and time again, he said that the NHS wouldn't pay the price for this pandemic. Two years ago, He made a promise to the NHS, here in black and white, his document. It commits to a minimum pay rise of 2.1%. It's been budgeted for and now it's being taken away. He shakes his head. His MPs voted for it. So why, after everything the NHS has done for us, is he now breaking promise after promise? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, he, he voted against the document in, uh, in question, which is to, to, to crown the absurdity of, it, uh, of his point. Uh, this, under, this, under this government, we have massively increased funding uh, for our 
amazing NHS, with the result, as I say, there are 6,500 more doctors uh, this year than there were last year, uh, 18,000 more healthcare uh, workers, and 10,600 more nurses. And we're going to go on, Mr Speaker, and we are going to deliver our promises. I can tell the right honourable gentleman. We are going to go on and we're going to build uh, 40 more hospitals, and we're going to recruit uh, 50,000 more nurses, and we're going to get on and deliver on our pledges to the British people. And we're going to do that because of our sound management of the economy and the fastest vaccine uh, rollout programme of any comparable country, uh, which, frankly, uh, if we'd followed uh, his precepts and his ideas, uh, we would certainly not have been able to achieve. He says he voted for it. He did. And now he's ripped it up. 2.1% ripped up. And if the Prime Minister won't listen to me, he should listen to what his own Conservative MPs are saying about this. His own side. This is what they say. Behind you, Prime Minister, it's inept. It's unacceptable. It's pathetic. These are Conservative MPs about the Prime Minister's pay cut for nurses. And that's before his answers today. Another of MPs said this, Mr Speaker, and this is perhaps the most telling of all the comments. This MP said, sitting behind him, the public just hear 1% and they think how mean we are. Mr Speaker, even his own MPs know he's got this wrong. Why is he going ahead with it? Uh, Mr Speaker, what the public know is that we're increasing uh, pay for starting pay for nurses by 12.8% over the last three years. Uh, they know that this government uh, in the last year has put another £5,000 bursary into the pockets uh, of nurses because we support them, and, uh, as well as the 3000 extra uh, for training. And uh, Of course, uh, it's very, very important that the public sector pay review body uh, should come back uh, with its proposals, and we will, of course, study them. Uh, but it, as I say, it is thanks to the investment made by this government that there are 49,000 more people in the NHS this year than last year, 10,600 more nurses helping to relieve the burden on our hard-pressed nurses. That is what this government is investing in. Speaker, he says we support them, we'll reward them. He's cutting their pay. Mr Speaker, not true, he says. Not true. Prime Minister, a 1% rise versus 1.7% inflation rise. That is a real terms cut. And if the Prime Minister doesn't understand that, we really are in trouble. Mr Speaker, they promised honesty, but the truth is they can afford to give Dominic Cummings a 40% tax right, pay rise and they can't afford to reward the NHS properly. The mask really is slipping, and we can see what the Conservative Party now stands for. Cutting pay for nurses, putting taxes up on families. He's had the opportunity to change course, but he's refused. So if he's so determined to cut NHS pay, we at least show some courage and put it to a vote in this Parliament. Uh, Mr Speaker, the last time we had put in a vote, he voted against it. Uh, as, I, as, I, as I said before, we're increasing uh, pay for nurses. Uh, we're massively increasing our investment uh, in the NHS. We're, we are steering a steady course, uh, whereas he weaves and, and wobbles from one week to the next, Mr Speaker. Uh, one, one week he's, a, he's attacking us. Uh, saying we should be doing more testing. The next week, uh, he's denouncing us for, uh, for doing it, for spending money on, on testing. One week, he calls us for a faster rollout of PPE. The next week, he's saying we spent too, too much, Mr Speaker. Uh, he's got he's to he's make, he make his mind. One week, he calls for a faster vaccination rollout, when he actually voted, although he, he claims to have forgotten it, uh, to stay in the European Medicines Agency. Perhaps he'd like, to, perhaps he'd like to, to confirm that he voted to stay in the European Medicines Agency, Mr Speaker, which would have made that vaccine rollout impossible. We vaccinate, we get on with delivering for the people of this country, we vaccinate, he vacillates, Mr Speaker, and that's the difference. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The incredible success of our vaccination programme, for which the Prime Minister and this Government deserve immense credit, now means that tourism businesses in Blackpool can look forward to a successful summer season when the economy reopens. When the time is right, will the Prime Minister support a campaign encouraging people to holiday here in the UK this summer? And will he join me in Blackpool to launch that campaign 
and to showcase everything we have to offer. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I will look very carefully at my diary to see whether I can actually get up to Blackpool. But I have many happy memories of joyful evenings uh, spectating at the illuminations of uh, uh, Blackpool, and I know that Blackpool will play uh, an important part in the, uh, in the tourism recovery that we hope to see this summer if we continue on our roadmap. We have technical issues with the leader of the SNP, so I'm going to ask Kirsten Oswald, as the deputy leader, to stand in. Kirsten Oswald. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister published his plans for an Erasmus replacement without any consultation or discussion with devolved governments. The replacement scheme offers lower living support, no travel support, no tuition fee support, why is this Tory government taking opportunities away from our young people? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, she is uh, a delightfully concise question, I may say. Uh, but uh, she is uh, wrong about the difference between the Erasmus and the Turing uh, project, because the, the Turing scheme, uh, unlike the Erasmus scheme, which overwhelmingly uh, went to uh, kids from better off homes, uh, the Turing project is designed to help kids across the country of all income groups get to fantastic universities around the world. Kirsten yeah. Oswald. Mr Speaker, that's just not the case. We know we can't trust a word the Prime Minister says on this. He, he told us there's no threat to the Erasmus scheme, yep. but he clearly won't match EU levels of support. And it's not just us saying it. His own Scottish colleague told the BBC last week young people won't benefit from Brexit. Huh? He's, they've saddled a generation with tuition fee debt. Now they're closing the door with Erasmus. It's no wonder that students are choosing the SNP and independence for a prosperous future. So, Prime Minister, yeah. will you think again? Will you do the right thing? Engage with our EU friends and rejoin Erasmus. Can, can I just remind members not to use you? Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. No, I think uh, students should choose uh, the Turing project because it's fantastic and it uh, reaches out across the whole, uh, the whole country. And I believe, by the way, Mr Speaker, they should reject uh, the SNP because it's totally uh, a, 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 Scottish, a Scottish nationalist party, Mr Speaker, because it is, uh, because it is, failing, it is failing, the people of, uh, failing the people of Scotland, failing to deliver on, uh, on education, uh, failing on crime and failing on the economy. And I, I, think that the, I hope very much that the people of Scotland will go for common sense and instead of endlessly going on about constitutional issues, instead of, instead of endlessly campaigning for a referendum, which I think the la is the last thing the people of this country need right now, I think people want a, a government that focuses on the issues that matter to them, including a fantastic uh, international education scheme like Turing. Yeah. Yeah. Right, let's go to Jeremy Wright. Jeremy. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend will recognise that while COVID restrictions have been in place, children have not only had to learn online rather than in the classroom, but have also missed out on cultural, artistic and sporting activities with their peers. At the same time, cultural, artistic and sporting organisations have remained restricted in what they can do and despite the considerable help offered to them, are still in need of government support. So can I ask him to consider how we might put those two things together and provide for enrichment activities available to all young people over the coming months, funded by government and provided not by hard-pressed teachers, but by our outstanding culture and sports sectors, while they're unable to reopen to the wider public? My right honourable friend has been a great champion of the arts and culture sectors and he's, he's completely right about the role that they can play uh, for young people in the recovery and that's why the massive £2 billion recovery fund that uh, we've, uh, we've we've given uh, to thousands of theatres and orchestras, choirs, uh, music venues and others, uh, we hope will be used uh, for the benefit and the, uh, the cultural enrichment of young people up and down the country. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's fantasy bridge to Northern Ireland could cost £33 billion. This while our road and rail networks have been absolutely decimated from decades of underinvestment. The Conservative Party got a grand total of 2,399 votes at the last Assembly election. What mandate does he think he has to override the democratically elected people of Northern Ireland to impose a bridge that goes through miles of uh, unexploded munitions and radioactive waste? Yeah. Mr Speaker, actually, if you read the, the article I wrote this morning in the Daily Telegraph, uh, he will have seen that uh, uh, the, the things that uh, we've set out in the Hendy 
review, I think, would be of massive benefit to Northern Ireland, uh, including upgrading uh, the A75, which is the single biggest thing that people in uh, Northern Ireland wanted, by the way, and, uh, which the Scottish Nationalists of totally, National Party have totally failed uh, to do, as well as better connections uh, east-west within uh, Northern Ireland, which we should be doing uh, as well, as well as better connections north-south within the island of Ireland. It's a fantastic uh, union connectivity review. Uh, he should appreciate it. It's the way forward, and I'm amazed, frankly, at his negativity. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Despite the claims of Eastleigh Liberal Democrats, my constituents will be delighted to know that the concrete section of the M27 uh, will start to be resurfaced this summer. Does the Prime Minister agree that this shows that it is Conservative governments that invest in infrastructure and that, if elected in May, Conservative candidates like Gerry Hall will deliver, deliver for the people of Eastleigh, Hedge End and West End? It's, it's absolutely true, Mr Speaker. It is Conservative governments who, uh, who invest in infrastructure. It is Conservative government that's putting £640 billion into an infrastructure revolution. And I congratulate Gerry Hall on what he's, uh, what he's doing uh, to, to resurface the road and to make it uh, quieter. And I, and I hope that he will be uh, duly elected in May. Yeah. David Linden. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In extending the £20 uplift to universal credit, which we welcome at the beginning of the pandemic, the Prime Minister was clearly conceding that social security support in the UK is inadequate. So, whilst I welcome the fact it has been extended for six months, I would like to see it being made permanent. But can you tell the House why, if it was so inadequate, why it was not extended to those on legacy benefits, such as disabled people? Mr Speaker, throughout the pandemic, we have done uh, whatever we can to look after uh, people throughout the country, whether on uh, benefits or those who have lost their jobs, sadly, because of the, of the pandemic. And, uh, I, and I'm very proud of what Universal Credit has been able uh, to achieve. And I, I think that he should perhaps take it up with uh, his friends in the Labour Party who actually want to abolish Universal Credit. We'd now go to Leah Nietzsche. Leah. Mr Speaker, last week Grimsley celebrated the Chancellor's announcements of the Towns Fund and the Humber Freeport. And it's clear to the people of Grimsby that it's this government that is determined not to neglect the town like Labour predecessors. Our next challenge is to raise skills and education and achievement in the town. Um, would the Prime Minister outline how people can take advantage of the new lifetime skills guarantee that is launching next month? Thank you. Well, Mr Speaker, the fantastic thing about the Lifetime Skills Guarantee is that in very, very tough circumstances, with many people uh, having, uh, I'm afraid, inevitably to, uh, to seek new jobs, to find ways of, of retraining, uh, as will happen in a, in a changing economy, it offers everybody, uh, adults uh, over 23, the opportunity uh, £3,000 on an A-level equivalent uh, qualification that I think will be absolutely instrumental in helping, uh, in helping uh, young people uh, 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 beyond uh, school age to retrain and get the jobs they need. The Lifetime Skills Guarantee is the first time it's been done, Mr Speaker. Right, let's go to Claire Hanna. Claire. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It takes some 16,000 dedicated nurses to staff Northern Ireland's health service, costing around £380 million per year. That's less than 2% of UK sales for just one internet giant, Amazon, whose revenues doubled during lockdown. What possible reason can the Prime Minister and his Chancellor, who both talked about the need to pay for this pandemic, have to not apply a modest windfall tax on those businesses who have benefited so much from the pandemic in order to properly pay those staff who have worked so hard to bring us through the pandemic? Actually, I think that she's making an important point about the discrepancy in the tax paid uh, by some uh, online businesses and, uh, and some concrete businesses, and that's a, uh, an issue which the, the Chancellor is trying to address in an equitable way, uh, working uh, with colleagues in the G7 uh, and around the world. Let's go to Cheryl Murray. Cheryl. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, we've seen the disgraceful way the EU have responded to UK fish exports. Part of the answer is for UK consumers to buy British fish. As chairman of the APPG for Fisheries, could I invite the Prime Minister to join a fantastic British chef to show how easy it is to prepare and cook a dish using British caught fish? 
Well, I'm very happy to, to take up my honourable friend's suggestion. I'm not the greatest chef myself, uh, but I, will, I, have, I have made and can make uh, from memory uh, a fish pie with haddock and prawns, which I undertake to do, uh, Mr Speaker. British haddock. Here, Tosman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, people like my constituent, Tessa Stevens, have had to keep their salons shut despite shrinking government support, unchanged overheads and decreased profits. I am urgently seeking the Prime Minister's support to protect the immediate and long-term recovery of beauty businesses and the jobs it supports. Will the Prime Minister explain why his government refuses to listen to the beauty industry who are calling for VAT to be temporarily reduced to 5% for hair and beauty businesses, similar to what has happened to other sectors like hospitality, tourism and culture businesses? Yes. Uh, she, I'm a, she's absolutely right in what she says about the importance of uh, a beauty uh, businesses, they do an amazing job, and uh, we want them to bounce back very strongly uh, from the pandemic. And I want high street beauty salons to be opening up in the, uh, in the, in the way that they were in the, in the past, rather than uh, uh, people going around uh, giving services, at, uh, uh, cut, cutting hair at home. I think it's very important we revive uh, high street salons, and that's why uh, we are continuing uh, with the cautious but irreversible uh, roadmap out of this, which I think will enable a, a full recovery for the entire sector. But in the meantime, as, as she knows, uh, the Chancellor has extended furlough and all the other provisions that, that are necessary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I warmly welcome the Union Connectivity Review that's been announced this morning? It's brilliant news to connect the whole of the UK. But in West Dorset, Mr Speaker, we have single-track railway lines we have a three hourly rail frequency, yet we have the highest level of roadside pollution anywhere in the UK. Will my right honourable friend kindly support a levelling up rail proposal that will not only look to support West Dorset, but also some of the most deprived areas in the South West? Yeah. Uh, my honourable friend knows whereof he, he speaks. He's probably one of the greatest experts on uh, railways in this, in this House, and uh, we're certainly determined to. Uh, follow his lead and to upgrade services in the, in the West Country and, and in Dorset. Uh, he knows what's happening at, uh, at Dawlish and elsewhere. And uh, we've, uh, Network Rail has identified uh, proposals including uh, improval of the uh, performance of the uh, West of England line, which is currently uh, being assessed. But he's, he's knocking at an open door, Mr Speaker. Right, let's go to Dan Carden. Dan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Back in 2012, commissioning for alcohol and drug addiction treatment was taken out of the NHS and handed to local authorities. And those services are now overwhelmed after a decade of cuts and fragmentation. And last year, the UK recorded the highest number of alcohol-specific deaths uh, since records began. Addiction is an illness that can be treated. So will the Prime Minister urgently investigate the rise in deaths and bring addiction treatment back into the NHS within mental health services and give it the funding it requires. Prime Minister. He's entirely right, Mr Speaker, to draw attention to uh, the importance of addiction treatment and uh, its relationship to, uh, to, to mental health, and that's why the government is investing record sums uh, in, uh, in mental health. Uh, £13.3 billion, uh, Mr Speaker, and, uh, of course, treatment for alcoholism is part of that. Let's go to Theo Clark. Theo. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've seen firsthand visiting both the St George's and County Hospitals in Stafford the great work that is being done to support people, including veterans, with their mental health. But does my right honourable friend agree with me that, sadly, the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to have had a negative impact on people's mental health and will he commit to working with me and the Stafford Mental Health Network to improve and increase the mental health provision in Stafford? <laughs> yes, Mr Speaker, I, 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 I'm certainly very happy to uh, discuss that uh, with my honourable friend or, or make sure that she gets access to uh, the, the, uh, the relevant ministerial uh, authority. But we're, what we're doing, in addition to the 13.3 uh, billion that uh, I, I spoke of, uh, we've been supporting mental health charities throughout the uh, pandemic and particularly focusing on the mental health needs of, of children and, and young people, which is why I appointed Dr Alex George uh, to be our youth mental health ambassador, Mr Speaker. 
Smith. This government is failing young people. Before the pandemic, apprenticeship starts were down by 28% for under 19 year olds, £330 million unspent levy back to the Treasury, falling short by 81% in creating the promised 100,000 new apprenticeships. This month, I will be holding my fifth apprenticeships and jobs fair in yeah, Bristol yeah, South. Yeah, yeah. Will he join me in urging all young people to support that fair in Bristol South? But will he apologise to them for failing them so far? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think uh, jobs fairs are an important thing, and I know that colleagues across the House uh, do them. But I also think that the government can be proud of the record that we, we've had in getting record numbers of young people uh, into uh, employment. We're now faced with a very severe problem caused by the pandemic, and that's why we're addressing it not just with the lifetime skills guarantee that I mentioned earlier on, but also with the kickstart funds, uh, uh, the restart funds, uh, £2 billion going into kickstart alone to help young people into the jobs that they need. Debbie Moore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. After putting in a fantastic bid, Southport last week got a £37.5 million towns deal. This will be transformational and represents the levelling up agenda of the Prime Minister and this Conservative Government. When his diary allows, will he come to Southport to see these projects as they unfold and the impact they'll have on the lives of my constituents? Yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. I'm told that the, uh, that the boulevard of light on Lord Street rivals the Champs-Élysées uh, itself, and I will certainly keep my honourable friend's invitation in mind. McGovern. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In this House, we all know the importance of those people who've looked after our vulnerable loved ones over the past year when we have been unable to do so. So will the Prime Minister explain to me why, in this country, we have 375,000 care workers on a zero-hours contract? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm proud of what the Government has done to increase the wages of uh, care workers across the country with the biggest, with record increases in the, in the living wage. And uh, this country is unlike most other countries in, uh, in the world in the speed with which we've vaccinated care home uh, workers, Mr Speaker, and uh, their elderly charges. James Grundy. James. Thank you, Mr Speaker. First of all, may I thank the Prime Minister for his commitment to levelling up the North the benefits of which we are already beginning to see with a £15 million allocation from the government's Transforming Cities Fund, enabling the plans to reopen Golden Station in my constituency of Lee to progress. Would the Prime Minister not only welcome this progress, but also back my campaign to reopen Kenyon Junction Railway Station, which will help unlock the potential of Lee, provide my constituents with a vital rail connection between Liverpool and Manchester, and ensure Lee is no longer one of the largest towns in the UK without a railway station. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to support my honourable friend's uh, initiative, and uh, I, I understand that uh, the, the Goulburn, which he, which he represents, uh, was the site of the world's very first railway junction, Mr Speaker. Let's go to Alan Smith. Alan Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Anthony Jones, a ferociously bright student at Stirling University, was looking to do a Master's in Amsterdam. Pre-Brexit, the course fees were £2,168. Post-Brexit, the fees are £14,600. The Turing scheme won't touch the sides of what's necessary. Would the Prime Minister like to apologise to Anthony and countless hundreds of thousands of students like him for limiting their life horizons against their will? Mr Speaker, because I think that the Turing scheme is, is fairer uh, and it's something that will enable uh, students on lower incomes to have access to courses, uh, to great courses around the world, and I believe it's a highly uh, beneficial reform uh, to the way we do that. It's a truly global in its, uh, in its ambitions. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A new station at Mir and uh, investing in Longton Station and also restoring the Stoke to Leap line. Will my right honourable friends, the Prime Minister, agree with me that investment from this government has the potential to reverse the beaching cuts, restore our local railways in Stoke-on-Trent and cement our position as one of the best places connected in the whole UK? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I thank my honourable friend. I know he supported the bid for the reinstatement of the Stoke to, to Leak line. Uh, it's currently being assessed by the Department uh, for Transport as one of the beaching reversals which are so popular around the, the country and so right, and uh, he can expect an outcome in the summer, Mr Speaker. Let's go to Dan Jarvis. Dan. If the Prime Minister is serious about levelling up the country, does he honestly think that favouring the Chancellor's Richmondshire constituency over Barnsley for financial support is the best way to do it. 
Mr Speaker, we've, uh, de we are devoted uh, to levelling up across the entire country, and uh, that, goes for, that goes for Barnsley as well as everywhere else. Let's go to Chris Grayley. Chris. Mr Speaker, thank you. I know the Prime Minister shares my commitment to conservation around the world, uh, and I'm sure in particular he agrees we have got to reverse the tide of deforestation. Will he ask ministers in DEFRA to look seriously at my proposals for a kite mark scheme for food products in the UK so consumers can see clearly whether or not the products they buy come from sustainable sources uh, or, or whether they're coming from producers who are doing further damage to our environment? Prime Minister. Very happy to, to look at my right, right honourable friend's uh, very interesting suggestion for a, uh, for a kite mark scheme. But in the meantime, this government is leading the world uh, in tackling deforestation uh, with a £3 billion uh, investment uh, being led across Whitehall. Is the point of order relevant to the Prime Minister's question? It is indeed. Point of order. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister, twice from that dispatch box, said that the Labour opposition voted against the NHS funding bill and the 2.1% increase for NHS staff. This is not the case. Indeed, in the debate, as Hansard will show, I was explicit that we would not be uh, dividing the House. So can you, Mr Speaker, use your good offices to get the Prime Minister to return to the House to correct the record? And do you agree, Mr Speaker, that if the Prime Minister wants to cut nurses' pay, he should have the courage of his convictions to bring a vote back to the House? Can I just say, first of all, it's not a point of order. It is certainly a point of clarification. That part has been achieved, but I'm certainly not going to be drawn into a debate as the Shadow Secretary of State well knows. I am now suspending the House for three minutes to enable the necessary raise of the next business made. Order.